Hey guys, welcome back to Nadir Audio. In today's video, we're going to take a look at the Gashelli Labs J2 external DAC. So I bought the J2 about a year and a half ago, and I've tried it out in a few different systems, but for the most part, I've just been running it in my main system. I just plugged it in and been listening to it for a few months, and I liked it right off the bat, so I didn't do a lot of comparisons with other DACs until a little bit more recently. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later in this video. But I should mention that at the time I bought it, a year and a half ago, uh, they did go in and out of stock, but I was able to get it pretty quickly and they shipped it out quickly. Uh, but these have become a lot more popular in the time since then. So if you order one now, uh, you're, you're currently looking at an 8 to 10 week wait before they'll be able to ship it out to you. Now, according to their website, they have made some capital investments. Uh, they have a pick and place system that they just put online. So they should be able to catch up with demand and hopefully we'll be able to get these out a little more quickly than that. But you should be aware that if you're gonna order one now, uh, you are gonna be dealing with that. Now, when I did order it, you could pick out these different case colors and the faceplate colors. Uh, I picked a red case with sort of a neon orange faceplate, which I think looked really cool. And that is still available. All the options that were available then are available now, but they do have some additional options. You actually can get a wood case now, which is pretty cool. And you can also order it with different DAC chips that it's based around. So mine has the original J2 DAC chip, which I believe is an ES9026 Pro. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about the device itself. So the J2 is a pretty simple device. We just have a couple buttons here on the front panel. The left one just turns the power on. So if we push that, you'll see that it lights up. And there are some status indicators here. This top left one just indicates that the power is on, so that's always on when the unit is on. Uh, the bottom left here is a DSD indicator. Uh, this dock does support DSD. That's not something I'm currently using, so that's always off. And then the other two lights on the right are just indicating which of the inputs is selected. So we've got a total of four inputs as this one is currently configured. So we've got two Toslink and two digital coax. So there's a pair of them on the front panel. There's a pair on the back, and you can just use this input button to select uh, the different ones. So one flash on the top would mean that you're using the top, top link on the front panel, and you click it again, it will blink twice to select the one on the back, and then you can cycle through, and then the bottom lights are for the front coax, and then if it blinks twice, then you're on the coax on the back panel. Uh, so there's one more feature that you can do here from the front, which is if you just click the power button without holding it down, you can turn on the internal LED in this unit, and then if you just keep pushing the power button, you can select different colors and uh, different brightnesses here, which is kind of a cool feature, although in practice, I usually just will leave this off, so if you cycle all the way through, it will turn off again. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the back panel. So the first thing we notice when we take a look at the back panel is that, yes, the J2 supports balanced outputs, which is very, very cool. Now that's not something I'm currently set up for, but it's definitely something I'm going to be experimenting with in the future, so the J2 will come in very handy for that. But for the moment, I'm just using the RCA outputs to the left here. Now you'll also notice that there's kind of a blank spot on the back panel here. Now you can option the J2 with a USB input. Now I don't use USB in my main system, and I have a lot of other USB DACs, so that was just not something that I really needed. So I just got the base model which is $250 but for another $50 you can add USB if that's something you're interested in. So let's go ahead and put this guy back in the main system and compare it to some other DACs. Okay so we've got the J2 plugged back into our main system here. Now most of my digital sources are running through my television so we're taking the optical toslink out of that we're running that into an active optical splitter and then we can run it into three different DACs. So we've got a J2, but we've also got the Shitmati and the Topping E30 that we did a shootout between in a previous video. I'll include a link to that in the description below. Uh, these three outputs are then run into a switch, which allows me to select the one I want to listen to, and then that in turn is running into our amplifiers. So I will mention that I have used the J2 quite a bit with my Bayou Rising A10 tube amplifier, and it sounds great, I can definitely recommend it. But for this video, uh, we're doing A-B comparisons with these three different DACs, and I've mainly done that with the solid state setup. So we're running into a Shit Saga preamp, and then into a Shit Vidar power amp, and then into our venerable Kef LS50 speakers. So 
There is one other digital source that I use that doesn't run through the Toslink, and that is my Rotel uh, CD11 uh, transport and CD player. Uh, now that uh, is running via a digital coax into the DAX. Now I did try to set up a system like this where I could just select ones or have them all running at the same time using some AudioQuest Y splitters, but I, that actually I could detect a difference in sound and it was actually uh, kind of a degradation in sound. So for the the optical, I've actually did a bunch of A-B comparisons to see if there was any difference using the splitter and any difference using the switch on the outputs and I couldn't detect a difference. Now that doesn't mean that there wasn't a difference, it just means that uh, maybe my system is not resolving enough to detect it. Um, but when I tried to use those Y splitters on the digital coax, I definitely heard a difference, so that wasn't working out. So anytime I'm referring to a CD in this video, I basically was just physically unplugging the digital coax from one DAC to another to be able to compare them. So it takes a little longer, but it's still perfectly fine and I can do A-B comparisons. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, talk a little bit about the differences I heard in sound between these three different DACs. So it was interesting getting the Topping E30 and Shitmati back out and doing a comparison in this setup. So in the previous video, we were comparing it using a tube amp. This time we're doing solid state, so it was sort of interesting to see how the character of each changed a little bit in this stereo. So we'll start out talking a little bit about the similarities between these DACs. So I would say that they're all highly resolving DACs. They can all retrieve a lot of detail on the top end, give you a lot of that micro details that really good recordings can give you. Uh, they all do well in the mid-range. They all can deliver a solid tone uh, with jazz horns, female vocals, that sort of thing. And they all do very well in the bass as well. Now in this particular stereo with the solid state amps and the LS50s, they can go pretty low, probably down to around 40 hertz. And you get a lot more bass than you might expect without using a subwoofer. Now, in the previous comparison with the Top and the Mahdi, the tube amp, it's, it's actually a pretty good bass response for a tube amp. It's fairly natural sounding, but that's certainly not that amp's strong point. So the topping gave more definition and definitely more bass than the Mahdi did in that stereo, whereas there's less of a difference in this one. All three of these can deliver as much bass as I would ever need, and it's well-defined and it's natural sounding, and so I don't think that there's too much of a difference if you're really into bass, if you're using a solid state setup like this. So the one area where I really did see a big difference with the J2 was that it seems to be better at retrieving that sort of ambient room information. So sort of the space that you can hear around instruments. The J2 really is able to bring that out in some recordings where the others can't. Now the others can get it in recordings that really have a lot of it. Uh, and some really high-end audio file recordings, and we can talk a little bit about some of those. But I feel like the J2 is a bit of a standout there, and that's something that I personally really like. So that was one of the things that I'd say if I just had to judge these three in terms of sound quality, I would probably prefer the J2 to the others uh, just for that fact alone. Yeah, let's, let's uh, go through some of the recordings that I listened to, and we can talk about it in a little more detail. So one of the recordings that I really enjoyed listening to on the J2 was this CD that I discovered in a stereophile review a few months ago. It's by Barr Phillips and Georgie Kurtag Jr. It's called Face Up Face. Now they categorize this as jazz and I think that's just because there's a lot of improvisation going on, which is something I really like. But I would probably categorize this as ambient electronic with some bass. Uh, but it is right up my alley. I really like this kind of music, and this one in particular I really enjoy. I've listened to this several times. Now, this is a really well-recorded album, but it's not really an audiophile album in the sense that, yes, there is a live bass and there is some improvisation, but all of the other sounds and instruments, they're all being played electronically through keyboards and drum pads and that sort of thing. But they do sound really, really good, so they're they're using great samples and stuff like that. But I feel that this is one of the recordings where I really started to hear that sound around the instruments, which is kind of funny because in this particular recording, their only real instrument is the bass. But there are these other virtual instruments that sound really good, and they have this information, this ambient room information in them, different types of reverbs, other kinds of sounds. And I feel the J2 was doing a great job at picking all that stuff up 
and it was doing so, so more than the other two DACs. So I really like that. Now, I really enjoyed this. It's a great sounding album. I enjoyed it on all three DACs. Listened to the whole thing on all three. But when I was doing the side by side, I it really was a bit of a standout on the J2. So that was one of the things uh, that I really like about the J2. So another recording I listened to was The Red Hunter by Steffi. Now I discovered this on John Darko's channel. I think this was his electronic album of the year last year for 2022. Uh, but yeah, this is a really great electronic album. I really like the music, but it's also really well recorded and there's a lot of interesting information in here. So there, there is a lot of low bass in this recording. Now I feel like all three of the decks were able to retrieve that pretty well and the LS50s are able to deal with bass in these kinds of recordings really well. But this was another recording where I felt like the J2 really was kind of retrieving some extra information that the other weren't getting. And it had to do with just kind of an ambient room sound. It had to do with space around the different instruments or sounds. So again, this is another album that's not, this is not a live recording. This is all electronic. This was all mixed and probably done on a computer. But it sounds really good, but the J2 is just retrieving some extra information in there and it's just making it more interesting by making it sound a little bit more natural, a little bit more organic by just having not only the good imaging that we're getting from all three, but also just that kind of breathing room and just kind of hearing the space around things. I think that it made it much more interesting. So I really enjoyed listening to this the most on the J2. And the last recording I'm going to talk about is this CD of David Bowie's Lodger. Now I've had several copies of this CD over the years. Uh, actually the first one I had was on cassette way back in the 80s. Uh, if you're old enough to have bought recordings back in the 80s, you may remember that a lot of David Bowie's stuff was available at pretty low prices on cassettes. I think they had just printed up too many, so I had pretty much all of his album on cassette initially. And then I've had CDs over the years, but this particular recording is one of the ones where I really like the music, but I feel like it's one of the worst recordings for David Bowie. There's a certain muddiness and murkiness to the sound uh, that I never liked, and it did take away a little bit from the enjoyment of the music. Now, this is the 2017 Tony Visconti remix, and I do think that it is much improved. It's not still not a great recording, but there's there's more separation between instruments, there's a little more space in the recording, and in general it just sounds a bit better. But that being said, uh, generally the Mahdi of the three DACs, the Mahdi is the best at challenge recordings that are either muddy or that have too much compression. It's a little more forgiving than the others, but on this particular CD I found that the J2 was actually my favorite because in this particular version, there is some of that uh, ambient room sound. There is some space around the instruments that you can really hear and that really makes it sound like a better recording than it is. And it's noticeable. I mean, when you compare it, when you do A-B comparisons with the other decks, it really does sound best on the J2. Now, again, that's not going to be this, the case for all challenge recordings, but it did make me really like this recording, which is, is saying something. So, So overall, I think that you know, all three of these DACs are really good. I think they're all good examples of sub $300 DACs. I think if you already own one of these three DACs, there's really no reason to buy one of the other ones. I think it's, that's really just kind of a lateral move. Uh, you'd probably be better at that point upgrading. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. So I, I feel like we've done a good job. We've looked at three sub 300 DACs and uh, they're all very good. But I think that when we do a DAC again, we're going to be jumping up uh, at the next price point really uh, based on my research so far, it seems like it's about seven or eight hundred dollars is where you kind of get to the next level of DAC. So that's what we'll be looking at in a future video. But for now, I think that's it. So thank you very much for watching and I will see you guys all in the next video.